is found in Genesis, in the first book of the Bible, between chapters 11 and 23. Don't worry, we're not going to be reading all of that. We are going to dip in and out of the text. So if you've got a Bible or a device you want to use, uh, grab it. If not, the verses will appear on the screen. We're going to be mainly in chapters 17, 18, and 21. And we're going to focus on three things that have stood out to me as I've studied her story. And three things that will show us why we can have faith in God. Faithful and flawed, a challenging question, and laughter. So to give you a bit of context, Sarah and her husband Abraham were originally known as Sarai and Abram until God changed their names. And they were actually pagans who worshipped other gods. It was likely that they came from a family of moon worshippers. And one of the only things that we know about Sarai at the beginning of the story is that she was unable to conceive, which was why uh, Abram and Sarah didn't have any children. Just noticed that I can look at my slides over there. <laughs> But amazingly, in Genesis 12, God speaks to this guy, Abram. This elderly guy who worships other gods, who's a moon worshipper, and he makes a promise to him. He tells him to leave his country, his family, and his home. And I'm just going to read part of the text up here. This is what God says to Abraham. To Abraham. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's verses 2 and 3. And verse 7, he says, To your offspring I will give this land. Wow. What a promise. Who wouldn't want to hear that from the God that created the heavens and the earth? That he was going to bless them. But what an unlikely couple for God to choose. Why would God make this promise? It's because God wanted Abram and Sarai and their family to know that he is the true God and to know what he is really like, a wonderful, faithful God. And the good news for us he also did this so that future generations of people who would live on earth in the future, like us, would also see what God is like and choose to put their faith in him. For Sarai, not having children would have been seen as a tragedy and a source of shame in the ancient world. If infertility is something that affects you, or someone close to you, or the subject brings up difficult things, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that that can be a huge source of grief. It can be like a silent grief that people carry, which other people might not be aware of. But it should not be a source of shame. It should not be a source of shame, because we can't determine the degree of our fertility just as we cannot determine our skin colour, the country we're born in, the way that we really look. If you don't have children, even though you long to, and that was me not that long ago, then know that we love you and we stand with you. And I would encourage you to chat to one of the pastoral team because we would love to pray with you if you would find that helpful. Sarai's story is not about trying to believe hard enough that something particular will happen. It's about God's character and how he works in individual lives to work out his plan of salvation and to give us faith and hope for a future with him. So the first thing I want to highlight is Sarai was a woman of faith and a woman of flaws. She must have believed God's promise because she thought it was really important that Abraham, Abraham, at this point, had a child, so much so that she suggested he sleep with her servant. 
In the ancient world, this was a culturally acceptable solution if a woman hadn't had a baby two years into marriage. But it wasn't God's way, and it wasn't his plan for them. Abraham went along with Sarai's plan, and it led to turmoil in several different ways. But I want us to note here that the story is descriptive and not prescriptive. This means it describes what happens in this situation. It doesn't prescribe exactly what we should do in every situation. So what we're doing is we're looking to find the principle within it. I personally don't think these verses are speaking specifically into issues of fertility, like IVF and surrogacy and all the complex choices within them. But what they do do is they prompt all of us to look to God in difficult situations, to ask for his direction and his guidance, and to trust that he will lead us. The way that God redeems different situations can look very different in different people's lives. So quickly we see that although Sarai is sometimes described as mother of the faith, not all her actions were full of faith. She made mistakes, she got things wrong. Perhaps her actions were driven by fear or doubt or even the shame that she felt. But I find another perspective helpful here. We don't actually know how long Abram and Sarai were married before they left home and went to Canaan. But it was common in the ancient times for a girl to to marry in her early teenage years. So if Sarai had been 15, they may have been married for 35 years before even leaving. And verse 3... Thank you. Uh, says that they'd been in in Canaan for 10 years before she gave Abraham her slave. She She may have waited decades to conceive, not the two year cultural norm. She waited far longer than many of us could imagine. So Sarai was faithful, but she was also flawed. And I think that's something we can all identify with. We see all through the Bible that God uses people who are flawed, people who make mistakes, but underneath do have a heart for him. Just think of David, who had an affair and tried to cover it up, and Peter, one of the disciples who denied knowing Jesus. And there's lots more. I love this quote by Donald Barnhouse, who's a theologian that's written on Genesis. No perfect feet walk the path of faith. And that is the only reason that I'm standing up here to talk about faith, because I'm not perfect. And the picture I get is is of my daughter, who's a toddler, waddling about. Sometimes she reminds me of someone who's drunk too much when she falls over. But when toddlers learn to walk, they take a few steps and they fall over. They gradually take more and more steps, but they still fall down. No matter how spiritually mature we are, we can still fall over. Sarai's faith wavered, but God didn't write her off. In fact, in Genesis 17... It tells us that God changed her name to show that he was going to change her circumstances and he was still going to fulfill his promise to her. So let's read chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. God also said to Abraham, because he's changed Abraham's name now, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. You may or may not realize that up until this point, God had only spoken his promise to Abraham. He hadn't actually mentioned who the mother would be. But here, God makes the promise more specific and he includes Sarah. 
The name Sarah means princess. And God says here that she will be the mother of nations and kings. And that's because her son will carry the blessing of God. And from their family line will come Jesus. What a wonderful turnaround. This shows that we can put our faith in God. And we can trust that he can use us despite our flaws. And this leads on to the second thing that I want to highlight, which is a question that brings a challenge. We're going to read part of Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 to 15. And it talks about three men visiting Abram. And the one who speaks to him is God in human form. Where is your wife Sarah, they ask him. There, in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind them. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did. The rhetorical question here is what leaps out to me. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Why does God ask this about himself? Theoretically, we know that if God is God, then surely nothing is too hard for him. But suddenly, the question becomes a lot more challenging when it becomes personal when it relates to something in our personal circumstances. Maybe something that we've longed for for years or decades, like Sarah, or something that affects someone that we dearly love. We have to consider, what do we really, really believe? Is anything too hard for the Lord? For me, this this question captures something so important in Sarah's life and in our lives, is a question of faith. Will we choose to trust God despite our circumstances? But it's not a test that God is trying to trip her up on. It's an invitation to believe and see that God will keep his promise. It's more about his faithfulness than hers. And that is the gospel. That is the good, no- that is the good news in the Bible. The whole narrative of scripture is what all the stories like this one of Abraham and Sarah point towards. God is faithful. It's him that gives us faith and it's him that enables us to walk in faithfulness. He continues to be faithful and loving when we trip up or when we go our own way for a bit. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You can probably tell this question intrigued me. So I looked up the word hard in Hebrew, which is the original language, and I found that it could be used to mean wonderful, astonishing, miraculous, supernatural. So I find it helpful to ask the question with these words. Is anything too astonishing for the Lord? This shows me that this isn't just about possibility. It's not just about whether something's possible for God, but it's about his character, and it's about his heart for us, which is wonderful. It's pointing to the awesome power of a God who is good and kind and gracious. And this is why having faith is not about religion or duty. God is good, and it is good to know him. I find what John Walton, who's a Hebrew scholar, says about this question really helpful. He talks about how we can apply it to our lives today. So I'm just going to read this quote. So 
about is anything too hard for the Lord? The rhetorical question of chapter 18, verse 14, does not present us with a promise to claim, but an attribute to embrace, a faith to aspire to, and a hope to sustain us. When we face difficult circumstances, we cannot claim this verse as confidence that God will change our circumstances. He is capable of changing any circumstances. But perhaps the hard things that he will do is help us to accept our circumstances and grow through them. And I don't say this lightly, because I know some of you may be, may be facing incredibly challenging things, and I don't want to belittle that. But I do want to testify that this has been my experience. When my first marriage broke down, I continually prayed that God would restore the marriage and that he would make it thrive. I really, really believed that he could turn the situation around. And that was my expectation for quite a long time. My faith in God probably didn't look the way you might have expected it to look. I didn't go to all the church activities that I'd previously been involved in. I didn't talk to many people at church. I was fragile and vulnerable, and I only opened up about what was going on to people that I really trusted. But I was honest with God. I used to drive to work screaming my prayers at him. I would literally scream and shout at him. I questioned God, and I cried a lot. I found it difficult to accept that I would have to live with the consequences of a failed marriage, even though it wasn't what I wanted and it was not what I'd prayed for. But over quite a long period of time, God gently brought me to a place of acceptance that he was not going to miraculously restore my marriage. But what he did do, which I now find more miraculous is work in my heart and turn it towards him. He helped me to see his kindness and his faithfulness to me. He grew a much greater faith within me and real hope in Jesus for my future, now and for eternity. And I think that's something that I haven't really put in my notes that's good to emphasize. What we're talking about are things that have an eternal impact. He turned my situation around, but in a very different way to how I expected. I wonder what situation the question, is anything too hard for the Lord, brings to your mind. What is it that you long to see him do? Could you consider asking him to, ho- to asking him to show you how he wants to work in that situation? What is he revealing to you about his character? Can you bravely ask him to grow your faith and to give you a greater hope in Jesus for this life and the next? Is anything too miraculous for the Lord? Well, the question is answered. In Genesis chapter 1, sorry, not chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 21. And we're going to read verses 1 to 6. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. The Lord did what he had promised at the very time God had promised. This passage answers the question with a resounding no, nothing is too wonderful, too astonishing, or too supernatural for the Lord. Sarah and Abraham were both old, 90 and 100. Sarah was infertile and would have gone through the menopause as well. What an unlikely couple to have a baby. 
yet. God hadn't just promised that he would give Abraham and Sarah a child. He said that they would be the father and mother of nations and kings. And we see that as we read on through the books of the Bible, that their son Isaac had a son Jacob, who had a son Joseph, and the family line leads to Jesus. God doesn't just do what looks impossible. He goes much further and does more than we could ask or imagine. This shows that nothing is too wonderful for God. Nothing is too miraculous for him. If we look at verse 1 on that slide, it says, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. The Lord did for Sarah what was promised. Sarah's testimony here is that God has been faithful to her personally. And I love it that God chooses to work out his plans through individual people. He is not a distant God. He is personal. And he chooses to reveal himself to us through stories like this. The Bible is an invitation for you to be part of his plan. Let God's faithfulness in this story inspire you to put your faith in him. He might work in a different way to how you expect. It might not be the way you would choose. But be open, because he does do wonderful things. Let's move on to the third point I want to highlight. Laughter. The challenges in this story are not really things to laugh about. So I couldn't help but notice that there are several mentions about laughter. The way someone laughs can tell us a lot about what they might be thinking. When Ollie tells a joke... (laughs) I'm not sure what that means, that that got a laugh in itself. (laughs) When Ollie tries to tell a joke, should I say... I might laugh in a way that shows that I think the the joke is funny, or perhaps more often. Sometimes my laughter shows that really I'm thinking, you are ridiculous and I cannot believe you think that is funny. (laughs) I used to be a primary school teacher, and one of the seven-year-olds in my class said to me, Miss, why do you laugh like a horse? What do you say to that? I couldn't help but laugh in response, apparently sounding like a horse. And I'm not sure if he picked up through my laughter that I thought he was cheeky, edging on rude, and I'd be keeping an eye on his comments in future. (laughs) In Genesis 18, verse 12, when God tells Abraham that Sarah will have a baby, she laughs to herself. I wonder whether she laughs because maybe she's scared to hope again. And in verse 15, it tells us that she was afraid, which is why she lies saying she didn't laugh. But then later in Genesis 21, in verse 6, when her son Isaac has been born, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. What a contrast. Here, Sarah is laughing with joy. It's a laugh that reveals her happiness and her delight. (laughs) If she sounded like an animal, it probably wouldn't have been a horse. (laughs) Her infertility earlier in the story could have been a source of shame and ridicule in ancient times. People may have looked down at her or laughed at her. And it says her servant did when her servant conceived so quickly. But here, she says... Everyone will laugh with me. I'm sure you would rather people laughed with you than at you. God has transformed her. God has transformed her heart, and we see that through her laughter. Another wonderful turnaround. Kent Hughes, a theologian, says laughter is a sweet symbol of faith struggle. 
This is certainly true here. And it's interesting that the name of their son Isaac, which is the name that God told them to give him, means laughter. What an amazing reminder of the wonderful, astonishing, supernatural things that God can do. This story speaks of God's kindness and grace to an individual, to a family, to us as believers, or to people who will believe in the future. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too miraculous for him. And that's why we put our faith in him. As we move towards the end, my encouragement to you is choose to put your faith in God whatever your circumstances. Remember, we see things in faith with an eternal perspective. And as you do that, you will be open to see the wonderful things that God might do. And the other thing I'd like you to consider is how you can nurture others in faith. The role of all different types of mothers and of any of us who care for other people, is to nurture, which means to care and protect someone or something while they're growing. It involves providing a safe and loving environment and encouraging growth. And that's what we want to do in a spiritual sense. So my encouragement for all of us today, which is for anyone of any age, Let's be mothers and fathers of faith. One of the powerful ways that we can nurture faith is through the things we say and how we listen to each other and encourage each other. If someone's struggling, we don't just want to say the right answer and expect them to just kind of generate enough faith within them to believe. We want to meet people where we're at, which is what God does with us. We want to hear where someone is genuinely at, even if it means pain or struggle, doubt or fear. And we want to have a humility that recognise we all waver in faith. We can gently encourage each other to consider God's faithfulness and to ask for his help. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 8 says, might come up. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. The wonderful thing is that we can ask God to give us faith. And I feel that God wants to give a new gift of faith to some of you who have been very faithful over the years and decades of serving God in church. God loves it that you love him and that you want other people to love him. But sometimes we can walk a faithful path and yet not be full of faith for things that God wants us to have faith for. Perhaps you've spent years praying for friends or family to come to know God and they haven't. Perhaps you've been in faith to see God do certain things, certain things through the church and you haven't seen that yet. God wants to give you new faith for these things. Remember that Abraham and Sarah waited decades for God to bless them with a child. And we also can nurture others in faith, even through the way, even in how we see each other. We want our church to provide a safe and loving environment where everyone and anyone can grow in faith. Part of our vision is that we aspire to be a welcoming and diverse church. We want to welcome everyone, wherever they are on their journey of faith. If you find yourself starting to think that a person's life doesn't look like it should, allow God to change your mindset. Isn't it good that they've come into a place where they can encounter Jesus? 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 and 17 says, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, 
we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Let's choose to see each other and those around us with eyes of faith. We know that no perfect feet walk the path of faith. Thank God, because that means we're all invited to. So as we come to an end, let's remember, Sarah was a woman of faith and a woman of flaws. She experienced firsthand that God is faithful and he does wonderful things. He turned around her situation And he transformed her heart. So let's take hold of the truth of this story. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. So we can put our faith in him.